Ladies and gents, welcome to the show. This episode of the pod brought to you in association with Foxton's. Would you like your neighbourhood gentrified into a vapid, soulless, godforsaken hole? Perhaps you'd like to spend £3,000 a month to sleep in a child's bed smushed onto the mezzanine floor of an East London sweatshop. Admin fees, referencing charges, amped up rents in the middle of a cost of living crisis. All of it sold to you by an overconfident and hungover sociology grad. They know it's tough. They know you're fretting about your gas bill and the soaring price of food. But you can't have a cost of living crisis without somewhere to live. <laughs> Ladies and gents, it's the best of times, it is the worst of times, it's dystopia central. Uh, we all thought things had got worse or had reached a peak in what, 2016 with Brexit and Trump, but we have dismantled, diluted and declined every single year since then. Climate change is happening and there's no way to reverse it. Nuclear war is upon us and... Much like your Uncle Paul at the family gathering, there is seemingly no way of avoiding it. Our planet is ransacked and war-ravaged by our desperation for fossil fuels. And just when you thought things can't get any worse, <laughs> George Galloway has been elected as a member of parliament uh, to the UK parliament. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, welcome, welcome to your twice weekly uh, pick me down, really, is, is what this show is, isn't it? It's the only podcast that sets itself the goal, the USP, of trying to leave you more crestfallen, more depressed for having listened to it. <laughs> that is what this show is. It's, it's a downer. Guys, welcome to Aid Thompson and Other Disappointments, episode 259. Uh, what's up to the people in the live chat? Um, uh, this should have been a live show tonight, like a genuine live stream kind of thing. Um, uh, but once again, I forgot that my missus is out tonight. So my children are in the house. I can't really be out here uh, in the cabin. It all starts to feel very Maddie McCann if I leave them just, just in earshot. I, I sort of know that they're okay, but I just it doesn't feel right, you know. Um. So yeah. Anyway, here we are. Uh, it's me. It's you. Uh, it's mostly me at the moment, but it will be you later, hopefully, in the live chat. Uh, it's me pathetically trying to make this episode feel like a live show, isn't it? Um. Anyway, be that as it may, a uh, quick doff of those uh, doff of the cap to those of you in. Uh, in the live chat there, the instant messaging on YouTube. Uh, future me will be in there too, don't worry. Um, I shall uh, I shall jump into the chat for the premiere of this at half past seven to reactively respond to your mutterings and musings. Um, quick bit of podcast admin, actually, before we get started, uh, before we jump into the lunacy that was the last five days of politics in the UK. Um, I've got a map up guys i've got this new map that i've built some of you may know this others may not i do a lot of like coding software engineering kind of stuff and i built this map for the website which is funk-27.co.uk i think there's a link to it in the description um but basically you can go on funk 27 and it, you can find all of the old podcast episodes. At, like every episode that I've ever done is on there. And you can see T-shirts that I've designed and I sell. Um, they're about 20 quid or thereabouts. Um, and now there's there's a blog on there. Oh, there's a blog? There are blogs on it. But now there's a map on there. Uh, and I'm what I'm doing is I'm pinpointing members of like the Patreon community and the YouTube community members. Like There'll be a little pin for every member on there so if you are interested in joining the community or the patreon either is as good as each other uh if you join the certified tier well, there's three main tiers on there uh and that's the middle one if you join that middle one or upwards then you get a little pinpoint thing on the map I and mean, you can see how our cult because it is a cult you can see how our cult 
develops and grows over time. Um, so anyway, right. Just I, I just wanted to talk about that because I was excited about it. You know, you know when you build a new thing, or you do a new thing, or you complete a project, or you just you know finish washing the car. <laughs> You just want a little pat on the back. You want to tell somebody about it. Brag a little bit about it. You know, it takes you straight back to when you were like four years old and you showed your mum a picture of like a crayon drawing of a tree. You're like, look what I did. Yeah, that's great, Aid. Wonderful. Can you? Can I go back to this now? Yeah, okay. Um, Giving you a quick snapshot into my childhood there. Which is in no way, by no means illustrative of how i've grown up to be so desperate for attention i talk to myself in my shed twice a week like this anyway look let's go through the highlights and lowlights of the last five days in british politics shall we it's been oh it's been abysmal hasn't it it's really you know it's been it's been like a burst fire hydrant of well let's let's just go through it shall we so the week started, and let's start last weekend, shall we? So last Saturday, erectile dysfunction be damned. We had Grant Shapps demanding that we don't go soft on Putin. <laughs> and that was immediately before Rishi Sunak went hard on Lee Anderson. Indeed, everyone's favourite bleached Frankenstein and disingenuous conservative, or as I like to call him, Pamela lee anderson aka the fake tit uh he was let go for saying something wrong guys but it was something that was wrong but somehow was not racist or islamophobic things were said and those things that were said were wrong but they definitely weren't racist or islamophobic because how could they be guys how could they be racist or islamophobic when actually no one is racist in the UK, because racism doesn't exist. I don't know if you heard that. Take a look at me, said Rishi Sunak. Obviously, racism couldn't possibly exist. I mean, I, I, I couldn't possibly have sacked him for doing a racism when literally nothing in Great Britain is racist. Because if it were institutionally and, and at times socially racist, well, then that would mean that the only way that I, Rishi Sunak, had gotten ahead in life would be through classism. And we, 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 can't, we can't talk about classism, can we? I mean, you, you think institutional racism is an overlooked matter that isn't really taken seriously. Oh, it's got nothing on classism. I mean, look at the BBC. Look at the Conservative Party. All of them will have quota matching diversity hires. All of them will give themselves a pat on the back for diversity. But what problem are we really solving if every single one of your diversity hires went to private school with you and all came from money and affluence? What problem are you solving there? Oh, well, 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 well we've, got a, we, we've got a black man here and we've got a, a woman of South Asian heritage over here. I, I love our cabinet. I love the Conservative Party. It's, it, it, it's incredibly diverse. I'm like, no, no, no. You've just got a cabinet full of South Asian black and white millionaires. <laughs> well, I know that you're being sarcastic, hey, but actually, I think it's very good. I think it's very good to have a diverse cabinet. I mean, look, look, Kwesi Kwate. Uh... Went to Eton, <laughs> privately educated, city millionaire. Well, OK, well, well what about Suella Braverman? Private school up to Oxbridge. OK, well, what about uh, uh, Rishi Sunak? Uh, are you joking? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but but it's, a, it's a fact that they come from different, you know, South Asian and, 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 and people of colour. And that, that's the point, isn't it? It's more diverse. All right. OK, fine. Fine. Yes, it's it's more diverse. Great job. Good. What a, what a stunning success for social mobility. Um, anyway, right. Where, where was I? Oh, yeah, that's right. Ra racism isn't isn't real. Right. OK, let's move on. Uh, celebrity sex predator Prince Andrew made a comeback this week, leading the royals into a funeral. Unfortunately, not his own. Uh, William went AWOL and nobody really knows why. No one has seen Kate since Christmas. No one's heard from Kate in about 12 fucking years. <laughs> then one of their cousins snuffed it 
at 45, which usually would leave people like me shaken, you know? But now these days, with the state of the world, the state of the country, for men in our 40s, you know, now we look at a story like this, like, you know, like you might look at your friend's amazing holiday <laughs> that you're kind of a bit jealous of, you know? Like I look at the headline, it says, Thomas Kingston, dead at 45. I'm like, wow. So it's within reach. <laughs> it might not be that long now, really? Oh, thank God. And then, oh, what, what happened next? What was the next story? The next day of chaos was uh, James Cleverly and Rishi Sunak tried deliberately to mischaracterize the Gaza marches in London as mob rule. <laughs> And this is after they've already tried and failed sequential times to mischaracterize them as noisy and annoying. And then they tried to call them hate marches. And then they said the whole thing was anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic. And now it's mob rule. And they need to get a handle on it, is the latest attempt. Like, I'd like to know why protests are hate marches. Why protesting is mob rule. Like, how come the Prime Minister can't say Islamophobic, but he can call this lot anti-Semitic, you know? <laughs> like, how can he make that leap to, like, like words are important, but I'm not going to specify the exact word. But then in this instance, he has absolutely no problem with it, you know? <laughs> how come he can't call Leanderthal racist? Like, he's lost for words there isn't he? But he can label this lot mob rule. I'm like, hey, Rish Rishi, Rishi, how does this one gauge here? Is this, is this mob rule and a hate march or is it just a vague, ambiguous wrong? You know, which, which one? Uh, it's, it's definitely a mob rule. Oh, great. Oh, cool. Right. So you, you found the words now, have you? Well, well, congrats, you fucking nations. I was beginning to get a bit worried there. I was worried for a second. I mean, what with, with you and Kate Middleton just as lost for words as each other? I wondered if there was some sort of vicious new strain of mutism going around. But no, 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 no. It's clear to me now that you've concluded, just as indeed we all have, that you find your own voice just as annoying as the rest of us do. Go fuck yourself. Then we had the Wayne Cousins stuff. God. I mean, this, this is a guy who gets reported to the police eight separate times and still becomes a police officer. I mean, what, what kind of recruitment process are we talking about here at Scotland Yard, at the Metropolitan Police? For someone like that to be given a job as a policeman with that track record... I mean, is there, is there like a, a lady up in HR, in like Scotland Yard HR, and she's like monitoring it and it gets to like the sixth time he's been reported, the seventh time. And then once it tips over to the eighth time he's been reported for some sort of sex attack or sex crime, does the lady up in HR and resourcing and recruitment just ring a little bell like ding, 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 ding. We got one. We found another one. Yeah, just give him a badge. Give him a gun. And, and uh, do, do, do you know what? Give him a condom too. Give him a condom. Because we, we want to protect, don't we? We want to protect. We want to keep everybody safe. And then finally, finally, guys, just as you thought UK politics couldn't circle the drain anymore, couldn't burrow down further through the barrel and into the foundations, into the earth's crust, finally, in the early hours of this morning, Friday, at time of recording, George Galloway was elected as the Member of Parliament for Rochdale. Which is just... I mean, take a bow, Britain. Take a bloody bow. You have, you've really outdone yourself this week. Normally, I afford the Tap Dancing Tosser Award to a member of parliament, to a journalist who has fallen short of the standards I expect of them. Um, but no, this week, the entire country's going to have it. The, uh, the parliamentary establishment, all of the journalists who have played any role whatsoever in getting George Galloway elected, and indeed all of the voters in Rochdale who supported him. 
just great job, guys. Fantastic stuff. I don't know what's going to happen, right? When I, when I clip this, I'll turn it into like a little seven minute thingy and, you know, I'll put it on Twitter and, and, and people are going to be like, like, what is it with you lefties? You know, what is it with you bloody libtards? You know, you Ramonas constantly ragging on good old blighty. You know, what is your problem aid and all of your ilk? Why do you always got to be ragging on Britain? Why do you hate Britain aid? And I'm always like, look, I don't, I, I don't hate my country. I don't. I know sometimes that might be hard to believe because I spend my life ranting about it. I, I don't, I don't hate my country. I promise that I don't. But it would be a lot easier to love it if you lot stopped making it shitter. Now. Regular view. Oh, I've gone very, uh, very dark there, haven't I? Gone very, um, uh, you know, court testimony or w like a whistleblower hidden behind a silhouette uh, of something. So let's switch back to that. There we go. Um, anyway, th that would actually be quite appropriate for what I'm now going to talk about, um, because today is a big news day and you will be familiar with the phrase a good day to bury bad news. Right. We've all heard that phrase. If something is a good day to bury bad news. Now, the reason today might be referred to as that is because we have this Rochdale by-election, uh, the results thereof. Now, whatever had happened with that by-election, it was always going to dominate the news coverage, the party political uh, stuff in the papers. Uh, you know, you had the Labour candidate who then lost support from the Parliamentary Labour Party because of his the things he had said about Israel. Um, you had the very fact that it's a by-election and this is often seen seen as a kind of like a referendum on Rishi Sunak's polling support. You know, what does it say about his leadership? Will it bring a general election any closer? So the by-election itself is always going to like be blanket coverage. Um, but in that or like. Beneath that blanket, if you like, there are some other stories. And I can't help but think these are stories that have deliberately been published or leaked out today, deliberately, especially like the day after the Wayne Cousins report stuff. Like somebody in CCHQ will have looked at these stories and when they are about to emerge, when they're going to surface and blanket the newspapers and they would have gone, oh, oh yes, 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 right. Uh, Friday, Friday, March the 1st. That's that's when you can put that one out. So let's look at some of these stories now. And by the way, credit to uh, to my friend Sean, who uh, gave me these these stories earlier. He was like, why don't you talk about the stuff that's being like <laughs> hidden is being leaked out underneath the coverage of all this other stuff. So um, on that basis, let's go through a couple of them now, shall we? So the first one is this. This was tweeted out earlier by Lizzie Dearden. Um, it says the National Audit Office has released costings for the Rwanda scheme. We all, I don't need to tell you guys what the Rwanda scheme is, right? Um, internationally illegal, cost ineffective, cruel, mean-spirited. Um, it's tabloid fodder. It was never supposed to work. It was just supposed to dig Boris Johnson out of some negative newspaper coverage. Again, it's like levels deep, isn't it? He was having a bad week with a tabloid and they dreamt up this stupid policy. And now we all have to deal with it. Um, anyway, the latest round of, you know, analysis and costings and civil servants and estimation sessions has been released today under cover of the by-election coverage. And uh, this is what it looks like, guys. Um, up to £150,000 per individual for processing and operational costs over five years. One hundred and fifty grand just to process one of these people going to Rwanda. Uh, £370 million economic transformation and integration fund that money is going to rwanda to the rwandan government and again i don't need to tell you guys what the un what these international development funds make of rwanda or, or indeed their treatment of refugees like we've been over all of this stuff before you guys are smart people you've absorbed it i'm sure you could retail and rehash it all out all over again 
We don't need to go through that. But we do need to talk about £370 million is how much we are now paying to Rwanda. Remember, when this was first uh, tabled as an idea, as a policy, I think the cost was about, wasn't it? I think it was under £100 million when it was first floated. And then it sort of doubled. <laughs> As these things do. And then it's like gone up again. And now we're at now 370 million. Okay. And there's no way that that will come down. It's going to go up again. Have you ever like read about public sector projects? And how they just keep ballooning with money? Because they're just... It, well, I'm not going to go into it. But, but yeah. 370 million pounds now. Uh, 20,000 pounds fee for every single person relocated. So that's on top of the 150 grand that it's gonna that's gonna cost us to facilitate the transfer. We also have to pay Rwanda another twenty thousand pounds every time they take someone. Plus 120 million pounds on top of the 370 million. We're gonna have to pay another 120 million if we reach 300 people. That's what's so ridiculous about this. It's like. The Rwanda policy is supposed to be there as what? As, as a deterrent? That's the way it was always marketed. We're going to ship them off to Rwanda because it will serve as a deterrent. No, it won't. <laughs> because by a huge chance, 98%, your chances of ending up in Rwanda are like that. They're just minuscule. Even with this scheme put in place that's costing us hundreds of millions of pounds. Your chances of ending up in Rwanda are next to zero. <laughs> because it's like, well, you know, if we if we take 300, then just can you give us like an extra 120 million pounds? So it's obviously like, I mean, maybe they'll get 300. Maybe they won't. But 300 in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about 30,000 asylum seekers a year, 40,000 refugees a year. What is 300? <laughs> In no way is that a deterrent. I'm sorry, it's just not. <laughs> In fact, you know what? We, we can work out how much of a deterrent this is not. In percentages right now, right? Like, I've got my calculator. Here we go. So, 300 is how many they say they're taking. They didn't even say that's over a year. But let's say it is over a year. Let's say we have a really good year for sending people off to Rwanda. So, 300... Times by 100, right, it's 30,000. And then you divide by, like, what it's out of, which would be 40,000, right? So the chances of you ending up in Rwanda, if it is an incredibly good year, which it won't be, is 0.75%. <laughs> you stand a 0.75% chance of going to Rwanda if you are an asylum seeker. It's incredible isn't it i mean what else do you stand a 0.75 percent chance of happening to you <laughs> would it stop you from doing the thing that you really really want to do if somebody told you yes yeah, careful now careful there's a 0.75 percent chance that uh you could uh slip on that banana peel and get struck by lightning have you thought this through like, I just want to shake everyone that's involved in the Rwanda policy, you know, just explain to them human nature, human nature. They're like a, a human beings wants and desires when they're really set on a goal that they need it to happen and whether they will listen to a tiny percentage chance risk. Would that affect their behavior? Like, do you do you understand how human nature works? Nobody's going to listen to this. For a less than 1% risk. Like, if that was genuinely something that could affect human behavior, you know, if that like, a 1% chance that it might not work out the way that you want it to, your father might never have fertilized your mother's egg. <laughs> anyway, back to Lizzie Dearden. Uh, she says, the processing and operational cost payments will stop to Rwanda from the UK uh, if people leave Rwanda. And she says a reminder that they can hypothetically journey back to the UK again. And in that instance, the UK would go, well, you don't get your money then. Look, look, they've, they've left. They're stowawaying back to the UK. So now we've got to deal with them. So, uh, But it says, but if they do leave Rwanda, the UK will pay £10,000 
back to Rwanda again <laughs> to help facilitate their departure. So it's just, I mean, look, I don't want the Rwanda policy, but if you do, then you should be angry about this also. Because this sounds like the Rwandan government have walked into a negotiation room with representatives from Britain and they've gone like, yeah, um, how would you feel about uh, paying us even if we don't hold them? If, if they leave and they go back to the UK, could you could you cough up a bit of cash then? Oh, yeah, yeah, a absolutely. Yeah, it's only fair. It's only fair. Really? OK, I mean, we, we really did not expect that. We, we, we thought you would push back a bit harder. But OK, OK. How about um 20,000 pounds each? I, I, oh, yeah, absolutely. Why, why not make it 30? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's like the Australian Brexit negotiations all over again. I don't know if you guys remember the um, the reports of you know the negotiating team from Australia versus the negotiators from the UK. They were trying to thrash out a deal, and uh, I don't think there was much thrashing <laughs> going on. I think the UK representatives were just happy to be there. <laughs> and they just sat down. They're like, "We're actually in Australia, aren't we? Can you believe this? We're we're actually going to do." A trade deal. <laughs> well, this is spiffing, isn't it? After this, why why don't we all go and have a shrimp on the barbie? And like the Aussie representatives are like, all right, Jesus Christ, can we just get them to sign this stuff and then leave? Like, and and they did. And Boris Johnson's UK government trade negotiation representative signed away the British farmers' interests and made it... Didn't they make it, like, more lucrative to buy in Aussie meat or something? But then for us to sell stuff back to Australia, was there was something about it. And anyway, like, the representatives from Australia left the negotiation and they did their, like, news rounds, their media rounds. And they were like, we cannot believe that the UK just, like, gave us all of these conditions. I can't I can't believe what we got away with in there. Meanwhile, our guys are just like, well, I mean, it's it, it, it's a trade deal, right? That's what you wanted. That's what you got. <laughs> Yay for Britain. Waving a flag. Boris Johnson, Liz Truss was foreign secretary at the time. They're just like, yeah, hey, we, got, we got a trade deal. We could, we've, we've, why is everyone sad? Like, why? Why are all these farmers crying? So it reminds me of that. It's like, you know. We negotiate with Oz. We negotiate with Rwanda. Somehow we always seem to come away with a shit deal, don't we? Um, then we have more costs, ladies and gents. It doesn't, doesn't stop there. This is, remember, this is the bad news. They're blanketing, they're covering, they're burying with the George Galloway and Wayne Cousins stuff. Um, so, uh, so there's the... 10 grand per person when they leave Rwanda and come back to the UK. Rwanda still get money then. Uh, it says, in addition to the ETIF and processing fees, the Home Office have also incurred costs in setting up the partnership so far. Two million pounds of direct staff costs. Two million. Just to hire staff to be able to put this policy in place for 300 people who apparently maybe might end up there if we choose to break international law. Two million quid. 2.3 million in legal fees, <laughs> excluding claimants' costs, which the Home Office presumably would also be liable for. So two, point, so two million to hire in staff, 2.3 million in legal fees from various lawyers going like, uh, like what, what are you doing? <laughs> What are you doing, Suella? What are you doing, James? You both know this is against international law. What, what are you playing at? Um, 15.3 million in setup costs for escorting and training. Then it says there's also estimated future costs, including £1 million every year in staffing costs from this year onwards, £11,000 per person for flights, including chartering and fuel, because presumably they have to hire in like chartered flights because none of the airlines want to be associated with this dog shit sociopathic policy. Nobody wants like to advertise their British Airways, you know, flight sale or something on Twitter and immediately have a load of clapbacks underneath about the Rwanda policy and and all that. Um, 
And then here's, here's another big one. £12.6 million for training escorts in... Wait. Training escorts? Twelve million for training escorts. Is that like to take people to and from Rwanda? I guess it's not. <laughs> it's not the SW interpretation of escorts. Um, Twelve million a year for training escorts in 2024 to 2025, and then a million pounds a year in future fixed costs relating to that escorting. And then she says, and that's still not it, because the National Audit Office say those are just direct costs. And there are wider costs of implementing the Illegal Migration Act, which is what it all comes back to. The watchdog did not assess value for money, progress on the Rwanda scheme or the Home Office's management of the partnership in terms of finding out other costs. So great. What a, what a fantastical waste of money in the hundreds of millions of pounds already. And next week, <laughs> next week, they'll be saying, yeah, I'd love to make child benefit a bit more generous. But there isn't any money, guys. I'm so, so sorry. It just, I, I checked the treasury. I checked behind the sofa. I checked Rishi Sunak's pockets even. And there's just, there's just no money for child benefit. I'm, I'm sorry. Don't shoot the messenger. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just a chancellor. But yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it's not, a, it's not the best news, I know. But we're all in this together, aren't we? I'm like, uh, are we? You, I mean, you lot, are, you're all millionaires. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know, but uh, just, uh, just hold your nerve. Anyway, so that sort of that's been that's been snuck out today, hasn't it? Do you guys think it's deliberate? Do you think they deliberately hold these stories back? I mean, I obviously do think that. I think it's very managed when they leak these stories out on a good day to bury bad news. But maybe you guys don't. Maybe you think that this is, uh, you know, it's, it just happens to have come out on the same day as there are two other big news stories. Um, what was the other one my friend Sean sent to me? Let's, let's move on to the next one. So the next story is sort of fueled by uh, Question Time that was on last night on, uh, on BBC One. Um, and it's a rare appearance by Caroline Lucas. People who spend enough time on Twitter will know Question Time has become a sort of parody of itself in how frequently they will invite on representatives from like Reform, the Conservative Party, uh, people who are on the payroll of think tanks, you know, your Tufton Street alumni. And very, very rarely, despite them having seats and councillors, very rarely will you see a representative from the Green Party. But uh, last night, Caroline Lucas was on and the subject was about tax cuts. So you guys will know if you follow me, if you've done, you know, if you watched a couple of alternative paper reviews, uh, if you've listened to the podcast before, you will know that tax avoidance and tax cuts are something that I rant about quite a lot because there's so many layers and levels to it. Right. Firstly, I talk a lot about the national debt because it's so colossal and how like that's where all of your tax money actually goes. Everyone always plays dumb. Everyone's always like, how come the tax burden is so high, but everything's so shit? It's like, because none of your tax money is going on the hospital and police forces and school rack replacement. It's going on debt. That's why everything's shit. <laughs> Need to solve the finances. Um, so... So, yeah, so the subject of tax cuts is always, you know, in the journal political periphery because the Tories are always calling for tax cuts. We're conservatives. We're supposed to be low tax, um, but they can't cut the taxes. Rishi Sunak knows that. Jeremy Hunt knows that. Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves know that because if they cut the taxes, they wouldn't have the money there to repay the debt or to, not even to repay, to repay it, just to service the debt. Um, so. The subject in question time in all of its Torydom turns to who would cut taxes, right? This is what I mean when I say, like, the conversation in this country is always framed through a uh, conservative prism, isn't it? If this conversation was framed through a left wing prism, a progressive prism, the question on question time would be, how can we improve our public services, wouldn't it? Or how can we make the tax system fairer? <laughs> I 
I know. Mind blowing. Uh, but because it's question time and because it's powered by Tories and clearly influenced by uh, conservatives, if not the actual party, then conservatives with a small c, uh, then it is presented in a, a fashion like who is going to cut taxes? Are you going to cut taxes? We all want everyone to cut taxes, don't we? What have you got to say about it, Caroline Lucas of the Green Party? And this is what she had to say about it. Take a listen. Sir, we tell budget? you, David, that the Green Party would not be proposing tax cuts at a time when public services oh. are absolutely decimated, I when hospitals have huge, huge... I mean, I do love... I love when they have, a, you know, lefty on Question Time and they say something progressive and they get a round of applause, which you wouldn't necessarily think from a Question Time audience, would you? They say something progressive, they get a round of applause, and then what I like to do is zoom in on the obvious Tories in the audience... <laughs> <laughs> Look at the face. Oh, I tell you what, if they if they dare tax me efficiently and fairly, I will I will silently lobby to legalize human game and pov hunting. <laughs> Look at his Look at his face! When schools are literally crumbling, when universities can't cope. Hey. Look all, all like the three of them there. Like the, the bottom left guy, he looks like he's still inhabiting reality. But the other three are just like, well, this this all sounds very sad. But uh, I don't like where this is heading. I can absolutely tell you that the Green Party will be prioritising investment in vastly needed public services, not cutting taxes. And it's kind of wild, isn't it? Like that something as bog standard as putting some money from your salary into the kitty into the public funds to invest in the future of your own country, who many, many, many of you say you love, something that basic it has become so contentious. Like, oh, I, I, I don't want to pay it. No, I don't. I, why should I pay taxes to fund schools that your children will use? Why have I got to pay for you and your little nippets? My children go to private school, you, you, you chimney sweeping, soot gargling puffer. <laughs> and then then there's another clip uh, that came out. So f firstly, Caroline Lucas, very rare appearance. She says something which I think is sort of fairly, I mean, it's logical to me. Yes, we do need public services. Yes, they are really deprived. They have been slashed to the bare minimum. They do need more investment. She gets a rapturous applause for it. Um, and I think if it was framed to the general public in a left wing way through a left-wing prism like do you think we should adequately invest in the nhs and social care most reasonable people would say yes right but it's always and forever it's framed in a right-wing way like do we need to cut taxes though anyway so that was one story that bubbled up into sort of political circles uh, following last night and this morning but it has been blanketed and, you know, greyed out and beiged out by um, by the Galloway stuff. Uh, the other thing on Question Time that I just wanted to raise was this really fascinating clip of Tim Stanley. So let me just give you the context for it, right? They're all discussing tax cuts. Caroline Lucas has made her feelings known. People are saying, should the government consider cutting taxes? And if they don't, why shouldn't they consider cutting taxes? And Tim Stanley comes back with this. To answer that question, it's because it's my money uh, and the government already takes a great deal of it. <laughs> why, why, why do you think you need to lower the tax? tax? Well, because it's my money. It's my money. I, I earn the money, so I get to keep... No, but well, what about the schools? What about the roads? What about... The police forces, the hospitals, the social care. Well, you, you, no, but, but, but I, I earned the money, though. It's my money. Well, what about everyone else that pays their fair share of tax? I, I can't speak for everybody else. Fuck them. Fuck them all to hell. I want to keep my money. To answer that question, it's because it's my money. Like, it's the arrogance that gets me with this, isn't it? It's like, does he think that he's the only person that's annoyed about how much tax we're all paying? Does he think he's the only bright spot? He's like, oh, Tim Stanley, you're, you're a genius, mate. You've figured it all out, haven't you? Yeah, no, we, we all love paying taxes. Oh, I love it at the end of the month when I get my pay slip through and I see like 30 to 40% of my income 
has all gone to a government who have a habitual track record of spaffing it up the wall and handing it all to the bear. Oh, I can't get enough of it. Yeah, it's basically, it's my hobby. I know it looks like I'm really into doing a podcast and political content and paper reviews and stuff, but that is actually my jam. Can't get enough of it. You know, these telegraph scoffing morons who are like, well, I think I, I think the tax burden is way too high. I mean, it is, it is too high. Of course it's high. We have the highest tax burden we've had since the war in this country. You've borrowed more than you've earned for years. The national debt is so high and we all pay this money to what and these guys are just like, oh, forget about the national debt. The taxes are too high. We have the highest tax burden we've had since the war in this country. The taxes are too high, though. Like, how many times have you got to explain the same thing to them? It's like, because your lot over borrowed and didn't invest and it still costs money to run the country. Ergo, we are where we are. Now we've all got to pick up the tab. It's my money. So thanks a lot. And then they have the gall like next week to go like, well, no, don't don't vote Labour in. If you vote in Labour, oh, your taxes will go. Up. Oh, oh, my goodness. Really? Labour will put my taxes up. I, I wonder what that'll be like. God. I mean, the thing that's really shocking about this sort of stuff, whenever I see a right winger banging on about the need to lower taxes. The thing that always gets me is like. Tories don't really pay tax <laughs> you know, so why are they why are they banging on about it's like rishi sunak's tax return that wasn't even really a tax return it was just like a cover sheet from his accountant but somebody did the, the numbers on it and they worked out that rishi sunak that year last year had actually paid tax at around i think it was about 20 percent. that's how little rich people pay in tax they pay it at like 15 to 20 percent if that because you have to remember thousands of them set up these shell companies they put things into blind trusts they they don't even get paid by paye that's just something for you and me for the plebs to be taxed by that they can control they put all of their money in assets and dividends and stocks and the rest of it so they get paid at a proportionately lower rate. Rishi Sunak was about 20%. A nurse or a doctor in the NHS or a policeman or you or me, we all get taxed at, what, 30 40% of our income. And the Tories that people like Tim Stanley represent and soft lobby for, I can't imagine that they're on PAYE. I just can't see it. So why are they endlessly banging on about lowering taxes it's just confusing to me or at least it is until eventually jeremy hunt or rishi sunak will buckle and then just before the general election they'll say see we are we are cost cutting tax cutting conservatives guys because look look in our manifesto we have pledged to get rid of inheritance tax that's the one tax they can't escape just like death just like that old adage of like, you can't take it with you. Death comes for everyone. Inheritance tax is the one thing they can't really. I mean, there's ways around it, I think. Sometimes I've had inheritance tax described as. Um, a tax on the ill advised. Don't know if you've ever heard that. It's sort of uh, it's akin to saying, you know, if you get the right advice, if you've got the right accountant, the right wills advisor, yeah, you could. You could find ways around it. Um, I think that's what they'll do. They'll announce like they're going to get rid of inheritance tax because then that's technically tax cutting, but it's one that will only really benefit the rich. And then they will announce that they're cutting corporations tax to be pro business because then that's technically cutting taxes. But it's not something that you or me will really benefit from. In fact, they'll keep our PAYE and national insurance broadly about the same. Maybe they'll give us a penny off. But basically, by and large, everyone will still be just as fucked as they have been for the last two, three, five, 12 or 13 years. Nothing will change. There's no hope. Ladies and gents, that's the end of this one. If you have been enjoying these podcasts, is enjoying the right word? Honestly, I don't know. Um, then do consider joining the Patreon uh, or the YouTube community. If you go over to my profile, should be a little join button. 
on there. Uh, there's three tiers that you can choose from. Uh, so like, I think it's £3, £5 and £10 a month from memory. It's been a while since I've looked at it now. Um, and uh, £3 is just like, you know, you like what I'm doing and you're appreciative of what I put out, which is great. Uh, £5 is when you start getting, you know, you get into the Discord chat and you get named and shamed and credited at the end of shows like this. Uh, Ten pounds a month, you get a Skype call with yours truly, uh, and then there's there's some ridiculous tier. There's like a fifty pound a month tier, which is utterly shameless, really, that it's even on there. But you know, you don't ask, you don't get. I was like, Do you know what? Nobody will go on this. Somebody did join it, and I am endlessly appreciative because it really it it pumps me up. I'm like, oh, I'm obviously doing something good. People out there are appreciating it, so. Yeah, if you want to join the Patreon or the YouTube community, don't be a stranger. Jump on there. Or indeed, if you've enjoyed the show and you're not ready to sign up like that, drop me a little tip in the like. There's like three dots on YouTube. You can drop a little tip in the thing, and uh, that's just like a, a one-off two pound or five pound or however, however much you feel comfortable with. Honestly, there's no pressure because I think as we've touched on enough in this episode, the tax burden is high and we're all a bit financially fucked now. Uh, until next time, take care of yourselves, keep it booge, keep it Binfluencer, and I am out this motherfucker. It's my money. Oh.